video on and start the recording. So welcome everyone to this uh, Canadian eLearning Network uh, webinar and on Wednesday the 17th. Uh, for those of us on the Pacific Coast, it's still morning, but so I'll say good afternoon because I think the majority are certainly uh, not in the Pacific time zone. So um, welcome everyone here. Uh, just a little bit about this session. It will be recorded. Uh, we will be posting the archive links on our website uh, and uh, as well. So if you have questions, uh, there is a little hand raising feature which is located in the participant info area just above the names. So you see just above uh, Michael Barber's name. You can raise a hand if you want to interrupt or at least ask a question using audio text. Uh, and Michael, I will do that to, to get your attention if there's a question that comes up. Uh, and most people will post in the chat. So you have the text chat capabilities on the side. Um, if you wish to, you can drag your boxes away from each other on the default to resize them. <coughs> Pardon me, and the same thing as well with the, uh, the whiteboard. You can resize accordingly. So any questions before we do the formal introduction to Michael? Okay, if you do have questions, just feel free to text away uh, and I'll try to answer them for you. So welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Barber, um, who is a lead researcher and founder of the State of the Nation, K-12 Online Learning in Canada. Michael is also a founding member and director for the Canadian eLearning Network. And it's through his uh, patience, persistence, and his, uh, his tireless efforts that we actually uh, could combine to create the network. Uh, and so we're very indebted to Michael, but more importantly, the research which he has doggedly continued for almost a decade now to shine a light on what's happening in K-12 online and uh, blended learning as well in Canada. Uh, Michael did this research um, partially on his own, partially through iMichael, and now partially through working in the sponsorship of the Canadian eLearning Network. So it gives me great pleasure to turn this over to Michael, who will lead us through some of the background around the research and as well uh, some of the new ways in which you can access this research. So we've made it available on the Canadian eLearning Network website, so we're really pleased for that work and effort and again, Michael, your tireless efforts over the summer as well. So I'll turn it over to you and we really welcome uh, Dr. Michael Barber to give us an overview of what's been happening in the state of the nation here for the next uh, last little while. Mike, over to you. All right, thank you, Randy. I actually hadn't turned on my video before, so since I see you're using yours, I'll see if I can start mine as well. There we go. Um, so uh, thanks, Randy, for that. And uh, I don't know if I would necessarily say tireless efforts. I would say doggedly um, badgering people until they submitted to um, <laughs> basically my will. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where, uh, you know, for those of you that have been involved with the network, uh, it is an organization that I think is going to prove to be useful. Um, it's still relatively new and we are just in the process of getting some of these things done, um, much like the website, much like this webinar series, and it's our hope that as we start to build a cadre of this and um, as we start to have you know, a, a number of these that are available and that people start to become aware that they are happening on a fairly regular basis, that these are the types of things that will essentially attract folks to the network and that will allow uh, folks to get things out of the network that I think, uh, you know, we're all looking for when it comes to this particular field. So um, without further ado, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, State of the Nation K-12 Online Learning in Canada studies that we've been doing for uh, the past number of years now. When Randy actually said a second ago that it had been almost a decade, I had to think in my mind, um, you know, if that was actually the case, and, and sure enough it is, we're actually right now working on the eighth one. So as you can see, there's the collection that we've got. Um, the first year that we did it, you'll note, and it's kind of hard to see in the uh, screen there, but it begins a snapshot because that year we basically were doing it just to, well, it was just something that I did on my own for the most part, and iNAPL decided to publish it on their own, um, so we didn't have any sort of sponsorship. Uh, all the ones starting with the green one on the top, uh, we've had sponsors for each of those, and um, you'll note on the covers of each, you'll see uh, icons for the sponsors. Um, 
Okay, that's fine, Randy. I can turn that off. Um, you'll see the sponsors across the bottom, and um, you know I'm I'm indebted to those folks because they've allowed us to not only grow the particular project, but allowed us to add a lot to the project. Uh, things that we're able to incorporate into the, the Canadian Learning Network website, and um, much of which actually we're still in the process of doing. Uh, for example, the one that has the red top there, um, so that would have been the third year. Due to the sponsorship we got that year, we were actually able to create an annotated bibliography of K-12 distance education uh, research from the mid-90s to, uh, well, up to that stage, uh, something that while we've linked the old resource into the Canadian eLearning Network website, uh, we haven't had the opportunity to actually incorporate it into the site like we were hoping. Um, so the one I want to talk about a little bit today in terms of the specific State of the Nation study is the 2014 edition. So this is the edition that would focus upon the 2013-2014 school year. Uh, you'll note the covers sort of change after five years because after five years, um, INACL, even though they are the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, decided that they were going to retreat even more so into their American position and didn't want to be involved with the uh, program anymore. Uh, so the first new covered one, so the red uh, new covered one, was actually published by the Open School, uh, British Columbia Open School BC, which uh, I was quite thankful of. And then this newest edition was the first one that the Canadian eLearning Network were involved in. And because of that turnover uh, between really three organizations in the span of three years, it's put a, a little bit of a backlog on these. So we're hoping actually to have the draft of the 2015 edition, um, only two months late, um, by the end of this month so that it can actually go into print um, sometime in March. And then we plan to get back onto a regular cycle. Now, the regular cycle for us would be normally collecting data uh, for the project sometime in May and June so we could essentially capture that complete school year. So if we look ahead to the 2016 report, in May and June of this year, um, and it usually spills over into July and August, we end up collecting the data on the 2015-2016 school year with the idea of publishing the 2016 report sometime in the early to mid-fall kind of time period. Um, so and then hopefully the desire is, is that that would be the rough schedule for all of these studies going forward, which is really what we had for the first six years. It's only been um, the 2014 and 2015 issues that have been a little bit off. Um, so um, specifically looking at the 2014 edition, now I've got um, you know the, the link there below and I believe it's active. So I'm, if you, um, I don't know if I click on this, Randy, will it actually bring it up in? No, nope, it'll uh, actually launch a private browser. So folks, the second link is in. active. Sorry, um, maybe it, hopefully it's all there. Yes, it is active. Yeah, no, it looks to be working. Um, I wasn't sure if it would open up in Collaborator or if it would open up in um, on folks' own browsers. Apparently it is on folks' own browsers. If you go there, what you will note um, once you get past the um, the sponsors that are listed at the bottom is essentially what we've got done is the data and information link that should be a link to allow you to go into each of the individual provinces um, that are in territories and for that matter the federal jurisdiction that's um, focused of this report. Uh, you'll see a section called research reports which is where we actually post copies of the PDF of the complete report as well Starting in 2016, we'll actually start doing some focused studies, um, one looking at professional development in K-12 online learning, another looking at um, uh, teacher education in K-12 online and blended learning. And uh, from there, there's a brief issue paper section where we've essentially compiled all the brief issue papers. Any additional publications or presentations, so for example, links to the slides for today would fall under that publications and presentations link as well. We'll put a link to the webinar there so you'll be able to get at it a couple of ways. And then some information about the state of the nation as well as the sponsors that we've got there. Uh, so you can sort of see that across the top and um, thank you Randy for bringing that up for me. Um, perfect. So um, 
As I mentioned, the sponsors for this year's report, um, we are grateful for the, the support that we receive. It, it allows us to actually, um, well, for the most part, publish things. I, in particular, point out the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center, Inc., who are the ones who did um, most of the copy editing. They did all of the sort of print setting of the report and actually published the physical copies of the report that we've been able to distribute. And they did that all as an in-kind uh, contribution. So we are very um, thankful for them as well as all of the other sponsors that have uh, helped us out this year. So looking at um, the way in which we collect data for the study, essentially what we've intended to do each year is we've approached the ministries of education each year, uh, at least in particular starting with 2009 forward. And that tends to be the main source of information for us for most jurisdictions. Uh, there are some jurisdictions where the ministry really doesn't uh, have a strong sense as to what's happening when it comes to K-12 online and blended learning across the country, or the particular perspective that they want to provide oftentimes tends to be one that is less research focused and more propaganda or sort of government relations focused. Um, so in those cases, what we often do is we approach people that we know within the K-12 online and blended community throughout the province as key stakeholders to essentially use them to both verify information that we're getting from the ministry as well as um, to supplement information we're getting from the ministry. And then, depending upon the jurisdiction, some jurisdictions have wonderful documentation around this. Uh, two that I'll point to in particular, um, Newfoundland and British Columbia uh, have a lot of material about what is happening and the level of activity um, for particularly online, um, K-12 online learning in their provinces. Although you'll notice that we rarely use the um, documents in the case of British Columbia because I have to tip my hat to the ministry in that particular province as being um, not only one of the most cooperative uh, that we have across the country, but also one that uh, tends to be the most prompt and provides the most information um, without that sort of you know government spin. Um, as you can see from this 2014 year, um, it's the third or fourth year in a row now where we've had all of the ministries uh, participating as well as Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. Um, who were responsible for providing information on some of the federal programs that we've got. Um, looking across the country, essentially right now, there is some form of online and blend, online or blended um, online K-12 learning going on throughout the entire country. And depending on where you're living in the country, it depends upon how that tends to be operationalized. And there are some sort of trends that you can see throughout. Um, for the most part in Atlantic Canada, there are single province-wide programs that service all of those jurisdictions, the exception being Prince Edward Island. Um, as you start to move westward, you're getting a combination of either programs that are primarily done at the district level or programs that jurisdictions where there are district level and provincial programs, although in many instances the provincial programs tend to be legacy style programs. Um, so they tend to be programs that um, are using uh, correspondence or instructional television, something other than online. Um, you know, there are a couple of exceptions as you're going across there, and we'll speak about each of them in, in particular. Uh, when you're looking at northern Canada, uh, the three territories, uh, all three of them use primarily distance programs from the south, particularly Alberta and British Columbia, uh, although both Yukon and Northwest Territories have been in the process of developing their own programs. Um, and in all honesty, I would expect in the next two to three years to see both the Yukon and the Northwest Territories um, no longer need to use the programs that are coming from the, the southern provinces that they should have their own capacity built. Um, in terms of what this looks like in, in in terms of participation at the levels that we're looking at. One of the things that um, you'll note here uh, is that, you know, what, basically it's about one out of every five students, a little bit better than one out of every five students across the country right now that we are confident in saying are involved in online or blended learning. I'll say primarily online. 
Um, you know, I use the term distance education there because that's probably the best way of describing it because uh, many of these students are still using a lot of the, um, the legacy models uh, of delivery that are available, particularly in certain provinces. You know, so if you look at um, Quebec and Ontario as good examples, anywhere from a third to almost a half of the students that are listed there. Um, actually a little bit better than a half, I think, in the case of Quebec, are students that are taking um, their distance education courses through correspondence education. Um, you know, when you're looking at Nova Scotia, it's still a significant number there that are using uh, correspondence education as well. Um, you know, so, and that varies from province to province. Manitoba uh, still has some of that. Uh, you'll notice in a couple of cases you'll see the tildes or the approximate in front of those um, estimates there, and, and that's to indicate that they are estimates, um, largely based upon extrapolating out from data that we've been able to obtain. Um, but right now there's over 330,000 students that are involved in online learner distance education across the country. Uh, you'll see that depending upon the jurisdiction you're in, that could be over 10% of the students involved, but in many cases it, can, it could be one or two percent. Um, and you see a, a wide range of participation there. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention when I started, uh, although Randy did touch upon it, if you do have questions as we're going along, feel free to interrupt me while we're going, because um, that will probably make uh, the questions a little more, more relevant if you ask them as they're happening. Um, just to give you a sense as to how those numbers have compared, um, looking at you know the last two years worth of data that we have or that we've been able to publish, you can see that you know for the most part the numbers have either remained consistent or they have increased a little bit, um, but that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, one of the things you'll note, for example, is Newfoundland went down by about um, a third of the students that they had. Um, some jurisdictions, like Quebec, for example, went up significantly. Uh, you'll see a, a fairly big jump in Alberta, although that, again, goes from the idea of giving a hard number based upon, you know, what we actually know to be true compared to an estimated number, an extrapolated number. So we're not sure how much of that is actual growth or it's just a matter of our ability to collect data has increased. Um, you know, so there, you see some variation, but you also see some things that are fairly consistent uh, across these these two years. And, as the data has been coming in for the 2014-2015 year, that trend sort of remains the same. For the most part, the numbers are relatively consistent with some small increases in certain jurisdictions. Um, going across the country to talk a little bit about each, and I'll, I'll touch on each one, um, each province and territory uh, just briefly, and because I'm a native Newfoundlander, I always start on the East Coast, because um, well, the day starts on the East Coast, and, and in Newfoundland we started a half hour before everyone else, so that's why I always start on that side of the uh, country. Um, in Newfoundland, as I mentioned, we have a single province-wide program. It's the one that has been there uh, since 2001. Um, they did use a telemedicine model, so it was using an audiographics or telematics system. Uh, they also had a number of online district initiatives, and this single province-wide model grew out of these different um, programs that had existed um, throughout the 90s, really. Um, right now, within, at least from a regulatory standpoint, there is no mention of or specific policies related to distance education in the province, although it is worth noting that the one province-wide online program is actually housed uh, within the Ministry of Education. Looking at Nova Scotia, again, there were a number of district-based initiatives that were available uh, that evolved into a single province-wide program, um, although it is worth noting that they still do have a robust uh, correspondence program as well that, that mainly caters to uh, students that have dropped out or students that are uh, um, older than the average uh, student. In terms of regulation, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, New Nova Scotia is the one jurisdiction where, at least within the provincial uh, collective agreement that's been signed between the government and the teachers' union, they've actually focused upon, there's a whole section upon distance education. In particular, there are 11 provisions, and you can see some of the things that they um, focus upon within that. 
but it's it's quite interesting because it's really unique in, across the country um, when you look at that. Within Ontario, there are a couple of locals that um, have some language regarding distance education or e-learning, uh, as they call it. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, Nova Scotia is unique to that, and um, the uh, and as Randy asks in the the thing, and I'm not sure if that's how you're trying to get my attention there, Randy. Uh, yes, this actually has been in their collective agreement for quite some time. In fact, I believe it's been there ever since we've started looking at the State of the Nation studies back in 2008. Um, Nadim, I see you asked a question about why I called it an online program instead of a virtual school. Um, virtual school in the case of the program in Newfoundland would also be applicable. Uh, virtual school, at least within the literature, generally refers to a supplemental program. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with the Center for Distance Learning and Innovation in Newfoundland, you'll know that it primarily offers supplemental online learning. So online learning for students that are in a brick and mortar school or a face to face classroom and that are taking one or more classes online. Um, that isn't true of all of the programs here. Uh, the more generic term is to call them online programs or K-12 online programs in much the way that the more generic way to refer to the field is K-12 online and blended learning. Uh, so I tend to use the term programs um, throughout both the written document and as you can see here in the uh, presentation. Um, Similar to Newfoundland, the actual province-wide virtual school or province-wide online program is actually housed within the ministry as well, um, which is also one of the things that happens in um, New Brunswick as well. Uh, moving to Prince Edward Island, um, they actually had a video conferencing on our video conference distance education program when we first started doing this study. It was about three years ago that they finally phased it out. Uh, most of the time that they participated in the study, uh, there was only one or two or three classes that were being offered and it was less than a dozen students that were taking online learning through that mechanism. Uh, what they've tended to do is they've tended to essentially purchase seats in the New Brunswick program. And by purchase seats, I mean that um, whatever the um, cost of having their students enroll online in a course or two uh, through a New Brunswick program is you know worked out between the two ministries. Uh, while Prince Edward Island still has on the books uh, two um, Ministry of Education directives, uh, one was in 2001, the other was I believe 2005, um, that talk about how distance education should be used within the K-12 environment. Um, but that was mainly if you were developing a distance program in the province. Uh, so since they've started using distance learning from New Brunswick, those ministry directives really don't apply anymore, although they still are on the books uh, within the province. Um, New Brunswick has a, depending upon how you look at it, it you could describe it as a single province-wide program or you could describe it as two single-wide province programs uh, because they've got essentially a French language version and an English language version. And they do have one person in the ministry responsible for the English language version and a different person that's responsible for the French language version. Now in terms of how they're, they operate and how they're administered and the regulations around them, they're all the same for both, so it's probably a little bit more accurate to say that they have a bilingual um, or maybe two unilingual um, province-wide you know, programs that are combined into one. Um, the other interesting thing about New Brunswick, and it's the first one that we've had going you know, westward that has this, is there is a significant use of the online materials by face-to-face -face classroom teachers. Um, in much the same way that you'll see in some of the other jurisdictions. Um, in fact, in the case of New Brunswick, in some cases it's been almost 35 to 40 percent of the uh, use within the province-wide learning management system has been for the purpose of blended learning by face-to-face -face teachers as opposed to distance education by the online teachers. Um, a number of years ago, I think it was about four or six right now, uh, the ministry created this 100 plus page handbook that essentially the districts that were participating in the distance program uh, had to agree to um, implement in order to participate in the online learning initiatives. Um, so it includes everything from um, you know parental involvement to school level support to um, 
just the, the mechanics and administration of the program. And like Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, the uh, province-wide program is actually housed within the ministry. Moving into Quebec, Quebec is an interesting one because back in 95, 96, um, prior to that, they had a province-wide a distance program in 95, 96, they decided just to get out of the business of distance education, um, at least from the ministry level. And when they did that, they basically um, essentially removed any sort of regulation that they had with it. So what you have now is a number of programs throughout the province, some of which operate on an asynchronous model, some of which operate on a synchronous model, some of which are looking more um, from a distance perspective, others that are looking more at a blended perspective, uh, some that are using online tools, some that are using correspondence tools, and you know many of them are working in partnership with the school districts. Um, some of them are just individual into a specific school district. So it's a real sort of mishmash of things that are happening in Quebec. Um, the two sort of biggest operators are Learn. Um, which um, actually the, the president of uh, Canny Learn, Michael Canuel, um, he's the, uh, the principal or the one in charge of uh, the Learn program. Um, they work with, I think it's about 50 odd um, English speaking school districts and they provide synchronous online instruction, although they've got a wealth of asynchronous tools that are available and actually that's where the sort of the, the lion's share of their activity actually happens is with the the asynchronous materials that they provide, primarily on a blended learning basis. Uh, the other main program is SOFED, which is a correspondence program that's mainly designed for adult uh, students. Uh, so looking at Ontario, Ontario is actually a, an interesting one because uh, there are a number of different things that are happening there and there, some are being regulated and some are sort of going under the radar. Um, Ontario is a province that had a lot of district-based programs and really no provincial involvement. And then about a decade ago, the province, uh, through the ministry, developed a provincial e-learning strategy, seconded a lot of the folks that have been working at the district level, um, took a lot of the course content that had been developed at the district level, and essentially what they did was, uh, through e-learning Ontario, which is the provincial ministry unit that's responsible for this, um, they have a site license that's available for um, all of the distance education programs to use for their learning management system. They also have a master group of class classes in terms of the course content that is provided back to the districts free of charge. And then the districts can run their own district-based program. So essentially it's they're using primarily district-based programming, but it's using a lot of um, province-wide support through the eLearning Ontario unit. Uh, in addition to that, you have the Independent Learning Center, which provides a lot of correspondence education to adult students. And there are a number of private schools uh, operating in the province. And when you're looking at sort of the growth that's occurring, it tends to be within the private schools that we're seeing the largest growth, um, and proportionally anyway. Um, in addition to having this provincial e-learning strategy, um, districts have to enter into a contract with the ministry in order to essentially use those resources. Um, a number of things are in the contract, uh, including that if they enroll students from outside of the district, they're supposed to have the sending district pay uh, $780 odd dollars to the receiving district. Uh, but what you also have is that there's been a number of consortiums like the Ontario eLearning Consortium um, that have developed so that they cooperate between these boards uh, so they don't charge each other the fees and, and essentially work its way out. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things happening under this large uh, provincial kind of structure that's been put in place and, and it's one of sort of the few provinces where we see that kind of model developing. Uh, but when you're looking at sort of capacity and the um, the lack of duplication of effort, you know, when you look throughout most provinces, for example, those that have multiple programs, you know, everyone has a grade 10 math course. Everyone has, you know, this course or that course, which means that everyone has independently expended the resources to develop and continue to maintain 
the content for those courses. Um, you know, that's just one example of how uh, Ontario, through this sort of provincial system, has been able to rationalize um, the resources that are provided. Looking at Manitoba, right now there are three uh, programs that are offered. Um, the ministry directly manages the correspondence as well as an ITV program. Um, and they also support districts running their own web-based or online programs. Um, in order for a program to exist in Manitoba, it has to receive approval from the ministry, and the ministry uh, regulates at least those that are using um, the ministry's content. Uh, for those that aren't using the ministry's content, um, the province has less say in, in terms of how they operate. Um, the province has engaged in a, a virtual collegiate pilot program, and that's that actually that Manitoba First Nations um, group that um, I mentioned uh, at the top. Um, for the last two years, they've been operating. Um, they actually describe it as a virtual school, and the province is actually looking at that as a potential model moving forward, uh, which is why sort of they're piloting it now. Um, I'm not sure how long the pilot project is intended to last. I believe it's either three or five years. In the case of Saskatchewan, they're actually quite similar to um, the way in which um, Quebec has developed, although the response to those actions were very different. Um, in Quebec, when the ministry devolved distance education to the districts, uh, for the most part, there wasn't a lot of things happening, um, which is why we had sort of that mismatch of stuff going on in Quebec. Um, what was interesting in Saskatchewan is in Saskatchewan, around 2005-2006, actually no, it would have been closer to 2009-2010 when the ministry decided that they were going to get out of the business of um, offering distance education themselves and um, basically uh, turning it over to the districts, um, they actually did something quite uh, creative, I think. The ministry actually provided bridge funding for each of the districts, and the district could essentially use this bridge funding, and I believe it was a two-year, and Joanna, you can confirm that if I'm right on that, a two-year bridge funding, and the districts could use that to essentially build their own capacity or to essentially put it aside so that they could purchase capacity or purchase space in other people's online programs. Um, so what ended up happening was many of the districts had been having um, had their own online programs at the time. A number of others developed them using this district, uh, using this bridge funding, sorry. Uh, so right now there are about 16 programs in the province. And um, it's kind of interesting because one of the programs has actually developed a, a what they call the Saskatchewan Distance Learning Course Repository, where guidance counselors or teachers or parents can go in and actually search through a list of all of the distance courses being offered and who they're offered by and the format they're offered in and that kind of thing. So it's almost like a provincial catalog uh, that um, you know these online programs have put together so that you know, they're really sort of competing with each other um, for those external students while still in theory servicing the students that they are involved in. And as I see in the text there, Joanna notes that they're in the midst of updating uh, that repository site. Um, so it will be something to look forward to in the next year, I would imagine. Um, looking at Alberta, um, Alberta is an interesting case because, um, and I said a lot of these are interesting cases. So most provinces are interesting cases for different reasons is probably the best way of saying it. Um, in the case of Alberta, the reason Alberta is an interesting uh, case is because as it stands right now, they have no specific policy when it comes to online or distance education uh, and haven't for quite some time. Um, if you look, actually the only reference to uh, distance or education or distributed learning uh, as it tends to be called in the province is in actually the print high school principal's handbook where there is a complete paragraph that says if you are intending to either run or participate in a distance program, here's a whole list of things that you need to consider. And then basically tells you we have no advice on how to answer any of these questions or address any of these issues, but you need to think about them before you get involved in that. 
Um, now, as you can see, for much of the last decade, they have been in the process of trying to come up with something. Um, you know, so from a period of, of 07 to 09, you had um, an official within the Ministry of Education that was involved in a review of distributed learning policy and had consultations throughout the province uh, throughout much of 2011. Um, you had uh, these consultations and the release of this inspiring action on education, which had a big focus upon blended and online learning. Um, but, you know, that really didn't go anywhere. Uh, then the ministry cons um, contracted with a group of private consultants to do an external review of distance education regula regulation and activity um, that happened shortly after the inspiring action um, on education was released. And while that document was in theory going to be made public and going to be uh, used as sort of a, at least a guiding document for how the province was going to move forward, um, that document was never released to the public. And uh, here we are now four years later and there's still no policy around um, online or blended learning. But despite all of that, um, you have, you know, probably close to two dozen um, district-based private um, as well as one province-wide uh, distance learning program throughout the province. Uh, many of these distance programs also provide some blended learning. Um, you know, so there's a great deal of variation that's happening in a complete absence of, you know, policy or regulation or guidance of, of any kind. And, you know, one of the interesting things about that is when you sort of contrast it with its its most western neighbor. Um, so when you look at British Columbia, and, and Randy, I'm sure you can chime in if I'm a little bit off on all of these, but again, starting about 12 years ago or so, um, the ministry began regulating uh, distributed learning or online learning now um, in fairly extensive ways. There were a, a full section of the um, Education Act as well as a full section of the Independent Education Act um, 2003, so I was, I was close. I said 12, it was 13. Um, but the uh, the sections in each of these are quite extensive. So, you know, these are two and three and four page sections within the Education Act or the Independent Schools Act um, that go through and describe essentially how distributed learning is going to be regulated in the province. And sort of two of the main things that are included in these, this legislative language is the fact that the funding will follow the student based upon who is delivering the education to that student. So if a student, for example, were taking six courses um, and three of them were from their brick and mortar school and one of them was from an online program in the Lower Mainland and one was from an online program out on Vancouver Island and one was from an online program up in northern British Columbia, the school would get 50% of the funding. The, each of the three online programs would get one-sixth of the funding. Uh, one of the other things that they um, have included as a part of this legislation is the, um, this, uh, what they call a quality audit process. And it, it's a fascinating thing because it's one of the few sort of examples that we have of um, professional development, I would say, at a program level throughout Canada. Um, essentially what happens, and I'll get to you in a second there, Randy, um, essentially what happens is that these programs have a ministry official, oftentimes there is a administrator from another program that will come in and examine over a period of time how that program is operating and actually they aren't sort of punitive in nature. It's actually done as a way of, you know, here's some things you're doing that you're doing well that you should continue to do and then here are some things that, you know, you might want to consider, you might look at this other program over here that seems to be doing a little bit better. So it, it is really sort of a constructive kind of format designed to improve the quality of distributed learning throughout the, the province. And in all honesty, that quality mechanism that's built in plus the funding mechanism is one of the reasons why you'll note that uh, British Columbia has some of the uh, highest uh, proliferation both in terms of number of students as well and, and in particular number of programs. 
uh, you wanted to add something, Randy. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, there's, uh, um, it's just something that quality and audit don't go together in a sentence in British Columbia. There are audit processes which are followed, which are actually forensic accounting exercises whereby if a district claims funding for a student, uh, then auditors come in and ensure that there's evidence appropriately uh, there that the services were provided. So BC had a bit of a cash cow black hole sy syndrome that occurred whereby uh, school districts were getting funding for students, but then they languished and didn't necessarily get full completion or services that were provided. So that was the argument from the minister's point. So the audit process is that. But I sent you the link in the text message area there, and you'll see that there's a lot of accountability, but also quality metrics that are used. So there are standards that are there. There's also a quality review process, which is much more the professional development side that Michael was talking about, uh, whereby the teams go in and they look at their um, strategies around organization for learning, around the actual teaching and learning process. Uh, they have reflective interviews that uh, are part of the standards uh, and the quality measures, etc. Uh, as well, there's also satisfaction survey information that is uh, contained as well. So it's much more on the professional side of things. And uh, I know for a fact, having been in many of the PL schools programs, uh, they much prefer the quality review over the audit. The audit is a, a bit painful and is viewed as much uh, as the ministry trying to grab back cash from the school district. Thank you, Randy. Um, if I remember correctly, it is either in the 2010 or 2011 editions of the uh, State of the Nation study where Tim Winkleman actually goes through and um, he describes both parts as one process, um, which is why I described it that way, Randy. Um, but he didn't note that it had two parts, um, that it had that auditing aspect of it where they were looking at the numbers and that sort of quality review and in the way in which um, it was described in, I think it's the 2011 report, because I think in the first one they talked about the funding model. Um, and that may be because they both fall under the same subsection of um, that extensive um, regulation that, that we find in the Schools Act. Um, looking northward as we go across the north of, of 60 area, um, when we get up into, actually, not, I guess it's not quite north of 60, but um, when we hit uh, the Yukon, the first of our territories, um, one of the things that you'll note is they actually have, um, well, this will be common across all of the territories. The first is that most of the regulation for distance learning um, in each of the territories is basically done through interprovincial agreements or through inter provincial and territorial agreements, I guess is the best way of describing it. Um, so essentially the Ministry of Education in the Yukon would um, enter into an agreement with ministries in British Columbia and Alberta because those are the two jurisdictions that it gets um, distance learning from. Uh, as well, it does have some of its own program. Um, they have been actually over the last, I think it's been about four or five years now, um, have been developing uh, an, both a blended learning program and then what was initially a video conferencing distance education program, although that seems to be um, shifting more to an online synchronous model now. Um, and I believe it was in the 2013 report that they featured, uh, there was a vignette on the Watson Lake Secondary School uh, blended learning project, which was uh, really has become sort of a model for how they are doing distance learning because they've been um, distributing that now across a number of schools. Uh, so it's an interesting model and as I mentioned off the top, I wouldn't be surprised if within the next three to five years you see that um, the UConn would be doing all of its own distance education at that point in time. Uh, similarly with um, the Northwest Territories. Um, if you were to go back two or three years ago, uh, the Beaufort Delta Education Council had been um, in the process of creating a small distance learning program um, up in really, I guess, sort of what the, it would be in the northwestern part of the Northwest Territories. Um, the program that they were developing there has uh, been expanded a little bit uh, and it's now being piloted across three of the regional boards as opposed to just a single one. 
um, and it seems to be having some great success uh, up there. Um, there uh, actually a lot of the folks, particularly in the Beaufort Delta Council um, education group, are actually former Newfoundlanders. Well, I guess you're never a former Newfoundlander. Are Newfoundlanders and who had been involved with either the um, the, the telematics distance program in the province or with the virtual school. So a lot of the things that had been developed in Newfoundland in the, the 90s and the early knots um, have now been starting to be implemented in terms of at least the, the pedagogical strategies and the technologies as part of this pilot. Um, at the same time, they are still using programs from Alberta, primarily the uh, Alberta Distance Learning Center, ADLC. Um, Although, again, like the Yukon, I wouldn't be surprised if these guys in the next three to five years are able to build their own capacity. Um, right now, none of it basically has um, no programs of their own. They rely solely upon programs from Alberta, primarily the Alberta Distance Learning Center, ADLC, um, and um, like the other provinces, they are regulated primarily through agreements that they've signed with their southern provincial counterparts, although Nunavut is the only one that um, they've been trying to put together some kind of ministerial directive on access uh, to and delivery of distance ed, um, but they've been trying to do so for the last four years. Um, so I don't know how um, what's been holding up that particular development and um, how that will actually look and if it will take the form of a ministerial directive when they're done. Uh, I know just from the data that we've gotten from the 2015 report that's yet to be released, um, they indicated that they're in the process now of developing new policy around um, distance education that they would hope would lead to some pilot programs to start to build their own capacity. Um, so, you know, that's a positive thing there. Uh, and finally, we've got, you know, programs that fall under federal jurisdiction, and these are essentially programs that uh, focus upon First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. Um, historically, or at least up until about two years ago, um, the Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada would often opt enter into direct service agreements with these e-learning programs, and that's largely how um, some of them were funded. Um, the uh, ANSI has stopped doing that, and they stopped doing that about two years ago. So what has happened is those programs that weren't able to um, get uh, funding from other jurisdictions have, like Credenda uh, Virtual High School, have ceased to operate. Um, the other ones have had to focus upon trying to find funding uh, from other places, although in the case of the two Ontario ones, uh, they are actually uh, considered um, schools with ministry identification codes in the province, so they actually get funded uh, to some extent um, through their enrollment uh, because of that. Um, and as I mentioned, the Wapakaska uh, Virtual Collegiate, that's the Manitoba First Nations uh, project that is in the uh, pilot stages with uh, the government of Manitoba. Looking at, I guess, some of the trends that we've seen over the seven, I guess, eight years now that we've been doing this, uh, first is we've seen significant growth. I mean, as you can see from, um, it was the Canadian Teachers Federation back 15 years ago, actually I guess 16, 17 years ago now, uh, were the first ones to estimate the number of uh, students that were involved in K-12 distance education. And at the time, you know, it was 25,000 students. Um, looking at it, and that represented about half a percent of all of the K-12 students in the country. Uh, you know, right now we're getting up to, you know, just over 6%. Um, and in many cases, that is largely based upon estimates. You know, when I mentioned the earlier chart here, and you saw a lot of tildes in there. I don't know how many of you picked up on the number one there by Saskatchewan. Um, and again, this is for the 2013-2014 um, school year. Um, but when we went um, to the ministry that particular year, and um, I, I know I remember talking with Joanna about this afterwards. Um, the ministry indicated that there were 2,611 students that were involved. Um, based upon the individual program surveys that we did that year, we were able to identify over 5,000 students, and we had only had about 30 to 35 percent of the um, online programs that had responded to that. 
Um, so we extrapolated that number out. And I know um, we've been working with Joanna um, over the past year to uh, you know sort of figure out where that uh, disconnect was happening. But in all honesty, um, you know that's not an uncommon thing. I mean, you see the number of tildes that you see on this particular list, and um, you know while because we had that sort of discrepancy with Saskatchewan, it's an easy one to point out as an example, but in the case of Alberta, the ministry doesn't collect any data on distance education enrollments. Um, you know, so we can get the enrollment from the Alberta Distance Learning Center because we know that's the largest provider, and then if we can get, you know, another of the roughly two dozen that are in the province, if we can get a third to a half of them responding to the individual program surveys, we can make a rough estimate. But in all honesty, that 75,000 could be as low as 52 to 54,000. Um, it could be as high as uh, 100 to 110,000. Um, Daylene, the surveys for the 2014-2015 data have been sent out three times now um, to programs. Um, we started sending them late December. Uh, I resent them the second week of January, and I reset them at the end of January again. Um, I, I can check afterwards to see who uh, it went to in Argyle. If I remember off the top of my head, Argyle, I think, did respond. Um, so that's one of the third to a half that we were hoping to get the answers from. Um, you know, but it, again, you know, those are just, uh, you know, that's a, a good example. Um, Quebec is another one. Um, you know, SOFED provides the majority of those students. Um, if I remember correctly, it was almost 60,000 of the 70,000 that's there. Um, using numbers from the Remote Network Schools Initiative and from LEARN, and only using the online students from LEARN, we came up with an estimated number of 70,500. But if you factored in all the blended learning students from LEARN, well, that's about another 120 to 150,000 students right off the bat. Um, you know, so then that number goes up to almost 200,000. So a, a lot of this is, is, you know, you really have to sort of take this with a grain of salt, that, you know, we really do need better data. Um, just to give you a sense, even with the individual programs, um, the response rates in the table down there represent, if we were to add together all three times that we've done this in the past, because we didn't do it during the 2014 year as we were shifting over to Candy Learn, um, you know, but when you're getting less than a quarter of the online programs or distance programs in a particular jurisdiction that are responding, uh, you know, just about a third of the programs, it leaves a lot of, of guesswork. Um, you know, so any given year we're looking at basically a quarter at best. If we were to add all of the years together, we're still only looking at about a third of the programs we've ever heard from. So two-thirds of the online programs that operate in Canada have never responded to our request for data. Um, you know, so we really do need better data. We really need to be able to find out what's going on because in some jurisdictions we have a very good sense. In other jurisdictions we have very little. Um, one of the other trends is that blended learning um, really isn't part of this. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times that the numbers only focus upon distance learning and as you can see here, um, you know, certain provinces have some significant activity going on around blended learning. Um, you know, beyond the ones that I've got here, as another example, you know, the province of Ontario has been promoting blended learning quite extensively to the point that they want, um, I can't remember how many years are left in the mandate now, but um, when they made the mandate within five years, they wanted to have, I think it was half or a quarter of all the teachers and or students in the province, you know, engaged in blended learning. Um, and I think that's supposed to be up in like 2017 or 2018. Um, you know, so there's a significant amount of blended learning that's happening that we don't know uh, much about. Um, and part of the reason is because within Canada, unless you're actually actively involved in online learning, most people see blended learning as just good technology integration and just the natural extension of technology integration. And so the term blended learning doesn't mean a lot for them. Um, one of the biggest things that we've noted and that is really contrasted compared to um, what we see in, particularly in the United States, is that unions tend to be supportive. I always use the term cautiously supportive. Um, you know, the whole purpose of a union is to represent the needs 
and the interests of its members. But having said that, when you look at Canadian unions, for the most part, they have either been engaged in research or they've been engaged in partnerships that, and in some cases even passing uh, resolutions at their annual conventions where they are really focused upon trying to um, push online learning as a way to addressing the needs of learners that aren't um, you know, having success in a traditional environment. Uh, while it's not listed on this page, um, op, you know, the um, Ontario uh, Secondary School Teachers Federation uh, back in, I think it was 2012-2013, passed a resolution that basically said that every student in the province should have access to online learning if they wanted it. Um, you know, from a union perspective, that's, you know, quite forward thinking, particularly when we look at our, our our American counterparts on this front. So the Canadian unions, I think, you know, while they are cautious in terms of what does this mean for our members in terms of their workload and their quality of life and, and just the nature of how, you know, the job is changing in this kind of environment, um, you know, but beyond that, they are, have been quite supportive. And one of the biggest things is, you know, we need more research, you know, beyond just better data. Um, you know, if you look at that annotated bibliography that we developed four years ago, five years ago, um, most of the research that's in there uh, tend to be these one-off descriptive or overview pieces um, or oftentimes case studies that are applicable to where they're being done but not necessarily uh, generalizable to a larger population and in many cases they tend to focus upon some of the more unique programs, um, so even if they were generalizable, there aren't that many counterparts that could be using them. Um, the two groups that have probably done the most research to date have actually been the BCTF and Memorial University of Newfoundland. Uh, the BCTF and Larry Keene um, have been um, very active in, in looking at essentially what does distance education look like for our, our, our members. Um, you know, and, and Larry has published, uh, really going back to 2003, a number of um, research articles on this front uh, that are all available on the BCTF website. Uh, and as well, Memorial has had um, two federally funded initiatives, the Center for Telling and Rural Education, um, which was funded under the National Centers of Excellence, uh, specifically telelearning, and then the Clinic Center for E-Learning Research, which was funded as part of a um, uh, college and uh, sure, a college and university research association grant. So I know we've had a few questions as we've been going along, and Randy, there's one in the chat box there for you. Um, but um, uh, I know we've got a couple of minutes left over, so I'll uh, open it up to questions. And I see Daylene has one. Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks for sharing um, your work. I know it's been extensive and, and longitudinal to a certain degree, which is really cool, and the fact that it's Canadian-based K-12 is even more awesome, for sure. Um, one of the questions I have is you look from your macro lens at each of the provinces and the research that they've done. Can you give a sense of which um, model of online and blended learning and the, um, the policies and regulations and all of those other things and support at the provincial level, which do you find to sort of stand out or be a little more uh, forward thinking or ahead of some of the other provinces. Do you have a sense of that? I have a personal opinion on that and I'm not sure if everyone would agree with my personal opinion but um, as someone who does a lot of work internationally there is one Canadian model that I point to whenever I say this is how I think sh things should be done and in all honesty it is the Ontario model. Um, for as difficult as they are a Ministry of Education to get information from, I do believe that the model that they've developed where they have a single province-wide learning management system that they are responsible for maintaining a repository of well-developed, high-quality online course content and all of that gets made available to the districts free of charge for them to use how they see fit. So it gives districts the freedom and the flexibility to essentially implement the type of program that they need, the type of program that will address the specific needs of their students. But it takes away a lot of the um, 
a lot of the management issues of running a virtual school. Um, everything from, you know, dealing with tech issues to making sure courses are updated to, um, you know, all these kinds of things that really a school district and, and the folks that are using an online program don't necessarily need to be involved with. Um, and like I said, I'm not sure, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that depending upon which province you happen to live in, um, whether your opinion of, of that model would uh, be consistent. But, you know, when I speak with colleagues, you know, in, in, in New Zealand or Australia throughout um, the U.S. And, and other international jurisdictions, and I mentioned New Zealand and Australia in particular because those are places where I've actually been asked that very specific question. And you know, when I look across the landscape of online learning um, in all the jurisdictions that I'm familiar with, is there one model that I would recommend that we try to implement here? And it is the Ontario model that I do recommend. Kate, okay, thank you. And I'd be interested to hear it. And it doesn't have to be today what the um, research tells us about um, achievement results or, or successes in student learning, that kind of thing. Um, and I can probably get that out of your report, I'm sure. Um, the other, and I just, just as a, my question from before, so Wendy Plum is also here from Argyle, and neither one of us, or if I can just get you to follow up to see who that survey went to, because I know I missed it last time you sent out, sent it out as well, uh, just to make sure Argyle's in that one this time, that would be great. I'll let uh, Michael take a quick look at that, but Damien, I'm, I'm going to jump in and say that organization is only one particular lens, and whether it's centralized or decentralized and how it, it evolves, um, I think it doesn't really necessarily lead to effective practice. And you could argue that there's much more innovative and effective practice that's going on in other places. I've seen really great practice in Argyle versus some of the practice that I've seen uh, in other spaces in Ontario. Um, and that's not uh, to denigrate the, the approach or the, the, the events, but it's not necessarily the model that leads to effective practice. It's more of the practitioners themselves that bring it forward. But in terms of efficiencies from a provincial perspective uh, and opportunities, yes. I mean, right now, any teacher in Ontario can have access to the learning management system, centralized repository of courses and content, uh, and that could certainly is a leg up to building to good practice. Okay, great. Thanks, Randy and Michael. Thanks very much. To speak a second on your other question that you had about achievement, um, you won't find any of it in the state of the nation. That's one of the things that we haven't touched upon. Um, I can tell you that uh, just looking at what I've seen coming out of various ministries, as well as you know other research that's been done, there haven't been a lot of things published that say this is what the success rate is. Um, and Randy, you can correct me on the numbers here, but if I remember correctly, the um, BC last year announced that um, the success rate in the online courses was about, if I remember correctly, it was 80%, and it was less than a percentage point higher in the online courses than it was the provincial average, and this had been the first time that that had happened, so they had made sort of a, a bigger deal of that. Um, on the opposite side of the country, I can tell you that the CDLI in Newfoundland um, boasts anywhere from a 93 to a 96 uh, percent uh, success rate with their students, but they're also using a very specific model that really isn't replicated anywhere else in the country for the most part. Um, so it's um, um, it varies, and, and beyond that, it, I think it goes problems by program by program. Yeah, I think just to clarify on the BC data that uh, Dave Gregg had shared uh, PTDA before, uh, is essentially that prior when it first started in 2004 when they started tracking our five the records, uh, students that were taking one or more online courses uh, had a, lo a lower completion of graduation rate than those that were just in classrooms, and now that's flipped, whereby the completion rate I think is around 86 to 88 percent for students that are taking at least one or more online courses. Uh, well, some could argue that maybe it's a practice piece or maybe it's more of an accessibility to complete the, a full graduation program because they pick an online course. But essentially, uh, it's, you know, the, the, the overall completion and improvement has increased if students are involved in online learning. All right, well, seeing no other questions, and I'm happy to stick around for a couple of minutes, but this will allow Randy to stop the recording so that way we can uh, 
uh, get the, the link to you in a timely fashion. But um, if you do have any questions following this session that uh, you don't get a chance to look at uh, right now, um, my contact information is there below. Um, as Randy mentioned, we'll have a link to this webinar that will be posted on the Candy Learn website. Uh, it will also be featured in the State of the Nation under Presentations and Publications. And um, if you want just a copy of the slides, I'll have those available specifically up on my SlideShare account, uh, which you can access at michaelbarber.com. Excellent. I want to say thank you, Michael, on that, certainly. Uh, for that, just want to do a highlight of some upcoming webinars that we have. And I'll go back to your contact information afterwards. But March 16th and then the 20th, we actually get delve into the practice at Salazar Beyond Borders. Uh, Allison Hancock will be sharing uh, a teacher training course and resources that she has available for us. And then uh, Keith Harrison will be talking about their online course orientation for students. So uh, really quite looking forward to hearing from Palliser uh, in the next two upcoming. And we've got a few others in the hopper as well. So on behalf of the group here, Michael, I want to say thank you for sharing that. And again, all the information and data you have accessible to you on the Candy Lane website. So thanks very much, appreciate that, and uh, we'll stick around for additional questions as need be.